So one of the premier questions to ask is whether we should just accept the cosmological constant as the answer for the acceleration of the universe. We know that a cosmological constant can give you acceleration, although we don't understand the magnitude of the cosmological constant that would be required or why it kicks in at about the present epoch. You can view a cosmological constant as a quantum zero point energy that completely empty space, emptied of, of all uh, material uh, and energy is basically acting as a, a quantum harmonic oscillator. There is a ground state that has a zero point energy for that and you can view this harmonic oscillator as basically springs, so a field of springs um, throughout space is uh, basically a scalar field. So in the top picture, we have uh, a motionless field of springs, all the same uh, height, and that is a cosmological constant, uniform in space, uniform in time. Okay. However, you can also imagine that this field of springs, the scalar field, uh, would have springs that have heights differing throughout uh, the points in space, and that the springs could be bouncing, they, they could be varying with time. And so that's a generic dynamical scalar field where you have uh, inhomogeneities in space and you have evolution in time. And so one of the premier questions is which, if either of these, is a good uh, explanation of the uh, observations and the future observations that we'll make about our universe. So the, the sort of quantities that we want to deal with is, first of all, how much dark energy is there. Um, all, all the pie charts that you've seen on people's talks show it of, of order 70 to 75 percent. We can nail that down a, a bit better. Um, and we'll talk about that in terms of the, the uh, dimensionless quantity, omega sub dark energy or omega sub lambda. Um, how much is the energy density relative to the critical energy density needed to give you a, a flat space? We can also ask what is the behavior of these springs of this, of this ground state vacuum energy? Um, what is the equation of state, the pressure to density ratio? That's what enters directly into Einstein's equations uh, for the acceleration. And then you can ask about the time variation of it, which I've written here as, as W prime, a, a, a change in relative to the, the E folding factor, the logarithm of the scale factor A. And so that's sort of the notation in general. Omega for the energy density, W, W prime for the equation of state, telling you given a certain amount of dark energy, how accelerating is it really? How much, uh, how negative is the pressure? So we've discovered that there is dark energy. We still need to understand what it is. So again, we can ask the, the question originally, if you already know of something, the cosmological constant that Einstein wrote down 90 years ago, why shouldn't we just settle for that? Why shouldn't that just be the answer? And of course, the problem, is, as uh, Simon brought up in the discussion session on, on Monday, is that the magnitude we simply don't understand at all. We're off by a little bit of a factor when you do the naive calculation of how big it should be. Um, and so, of course, being, being physicists and astrophysicists, we say, well, okay, we, we need to fine tune it a little bit to get rid of those zeros. We haven't quite gotten it right. And what Einstein might think about this is a matter of conjecture, but um, certainly nobody in the 90 years since then has been able to explain these 120 orders of magnitude away in a, a constant uh, component, a component that is uh, basically set at the Planck era and yet it's somehow only coming into play today. So two good reasons I think why you should certainly look beyond the cosmological constant is that we have failed for 90 years to explain uh, the order of magnitude of the cosmological <laughs> constant uh, that we should have. Um, a second good reason is, again, we know there was, or we strongly suspect there was an era of accelerated expansion in the early universe, inflation, sometime between you know, uh, TeV and 10 to the 16th GeV, and we know that that ended. The universe that we live in today is not a de Sitter space, and so that had to have been a time-varying acceleration. It was not a, a cosmological constant. And so even though we know of no scalar fields that actually exist in the universe, we do know that there must have been something that looked like a dynamical scalar field in the early universe. Why shouldn't we have that again today? And so this is a, a good reason to, to go well beyond the cosmological constant and, and maybe not even think that the cosmological constant lambda is the, the favored explanation. 
The coincidence problem I'll go through very quickly because I, I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with it. As I said, you can think of it as a quantum zero point energy or a quantum C. And so if you ask what is the ratio of the, the quantum energy contribution to the universe to the uh, other energy contributions in the universe, currently we have this sort of 70 to 30 ratio. However, this is something that changes with time because even if the cosmological constant doesn't change, the other constituents of the universe change. And so if you go back a factor of two in expansion or forward a factor of two in expansion, the ratio is different. And by the time you go only a factor of four back or forward in expansion, you have a drastically different picture of the universe. So why should we be living in an era where they're about the same uh, uh, ratio, uh, contribute about equally? And so that's the problem that you have if it's a, a purely uh, time invariant um, contribution. And so that pushes you toward considering dynamical explanations. OK, so we have to think of things uh, on beyond lambda. And we still don't know where to look. Does it arise from quantum physics, or does it arise from uh, modification of Einstein's theory of, of gravity, for example? And there's a number of explanations that I've written up here. And I like to, to phrase them as these, these nice sort of paradoxical questions to really you know, get to you how, how revolutionary the physics is behind this. Do we understand the quantum vacuum at all? Does nothing actually weigh something? Or if we have to modify gravity, is an explanation for this looking to extra dimensions beyond the, the three space, one time dimension we have, so is nowhere somewhere. So to do this, we need some very clever theoretical ideas, and we need some highly precise data to rein in the very clever theoretical ideas. OK, so let's start off with these bouncing springs, the dynamical scalar field. So you start off with, with about the simplest Lagrangian that you can write down. You just have a kinetic energy term, and you have a potential energy term, a self-interaction term. And in the early part of, of uh, the last century, uh, Nurtzer told us how you deal with this, that there's a mathematical prescription to, to get a conserved uh, quantity, the energy momentum tensor, by doing a variation uh, of your Lagrangian. And when you apply that, within a homogeneous and isotropic space, the Robertson-Walker metric, you again get out extremely simple uh, equations to deal with. So you get out an energy density and a pressure, which are sums or differences of the kinetic and the potential terms. And if you don't, uh, if the homogeneity is, is broken on smaller scales, then you actually get gradient terms, right? This is a, a four derivative up here. So you actually do get gradient terms as well. However, the the field is so light that the Compton wavelength of the field is, is of order the horizon size or greater, and so these uh, gradient terms can be completely ignored. Um, so we're interested in asking how much acceleration is there, what is the pressure to density ratio, so that's given by the equation of state ratio W, and then you have an equation of motion, which again goes, you, you go through the usual Lagrangian prescription to get the equation of motion, and you have an equation which is basically Newton's second law. So again, those of you not familiar with, with scalar field theory, it's, you, you do know scalar field theory even if you don't think you do. This is Newton's second law. This is a second derivative. So it's an acceleration, basically a force per unit mass. Over here we have the, the change in the potential with a distance or with a, a scalar field position. And so this is really just F equals MA here, right? This is a force. And then because we're in an expanding universe, there's a friction term given by the, the Hubble uh, friction that enters in here. Alternately, it's trivial in, in two lines to go back and forth between the equation of motion and the continuity equation. So if you want to start off instead um, with a, a conserved quantity of the energy density, then you can simply go back and forth between these two equations. So we can look at the various limits as we get different values of the equation of state just to, to build up our intuition. So again, the equation of state is given by these ratios between kinetic and potential terms. And if you are dominated by the potential, this is often called a slow roll approximation, then uh, the kinetic energy is negligible and W is driven to minus one. And so in, during inflation, you're very close to that limit. Slow roll is a very good approximation. The equation of state is very close to minus one. You can consider the opposite regime where the kinetic energy dominates. Um, and in that case, W is driven to positive one. And so for these uh, canonical, minimally coupled scalar fields that I wrote down, that very simple Lagrangian, W will always be between minus one and plus one. 
In order to, to break that, you have to either break the canonical nature, that the kinetic term is just what you, you think it is, linear, um, or that it is uh, non-minimally coupled. Uh, there's all sorts of situations in between, minus one and plus one. Uh, the only particularly interesting one, I think, is if you're oscillating around the, a minimum and a potential, um, depending on uh, the, the, uh, the uh, shape of the potential, you get different uh, uh, equations of state. Um, the most common one would simply be a quadratic deviation. You expand around the minimum. The linear term goes away because it's a minimum. So then you have a second order term. You have a quadratic term. And then you have basically something that, that looks like a, a virialization um, where the time average of the potential and the kinetic energies are equal to each other. And that actually gives you a non-relativistic equation of state, W equals zero pressureless. And that's, for example, what the axion field does. It is a coherent oscillation and it acts as the, the non-relativistic matter. Um, formally, you can go back and forth between the equation of state and the, the properties, the Lagrangian basically, that, that describes uh, the field, the potential, uh, and the kinetic energy, the field value, and the energy density value. It is very simple to write down the equations formally, but it's extremely difficult to do in practice for uh, a very simple reason. If we look at this last equation for the kinetic energy, you can see that the amount that the field moves, so you're, if you're trying to map out the potential, you want to map out a, a fair um, sample of the potential, not just a, a very small fraction of it. However, the amount that the field moves in a Hubble time is reduced by this factor of 1 plus W. And so obviously, if it were exactly a cosmological constant, the field never moves, so you don't map out the potential at all. Um, but as W approaches minus 1, which appears to be the, the state today uh, from observations, um, then you see that the amount of the field that you move out, that, that you map out, is much, much less than M Planck. And again, if this is a high energy scalar field, you, you would imagine that things should vary on the scale of M Planck. And so it's really hard in practice to do this sort of reconstruction. You tend to map out only a very tiny part of the potential, and the question is, will that actually teach you something about the, the fundamental physics behind it? And so this is a very different situation than, than inflation um, in, in a number of ways, even though um, in inflation we say the field is slow roll, and that really determines the, the uh, evolution of the universe because the field completely dominates the universe. However, dark energy does not completely dominate the universe today. And so even if uh, you, you understand the, the uh, equation of state, it's not it's not giving you all the physics. So I call it the Goldilocks problem. I'm not sure if, if this is cross-cultural, the, the Goldilocks reference. Basically, um, this person goes into a house and finds a bowl of three bowls of porridge. One is too hot, one is too cold, and one is just right. And there's a whole series of things where, where she finds you know, something is, is too much one thing, too much the other thing, and, and you know, moderate in the middle. So inflation is relatively easy because it's, it's too much one thing. It's just completely slow roll. It's very close to the sitter. It makes things very easy to deal with. Dark energy, you can't ignore the matter. You can't ignore the other energy constituents. And so it's the bowl in the middle, which in the Goldilocks story is just right. But unfortunately, in physics, we like to do asymptotic things. It makes it a lot easier. And when you have a mix of things, it's much harder to calculate. So, so my, my view is that dark energy is a much harder problem than inflation. <laughs> OK, so we, we have the Klein-Gordon equation, the equation of motion of the scalar field. And then the question is, well, do we have to go through every single scalar field theory to compare it to observations um, to find out which is the correct one? Or is there a, a more phenomenological approach, a more model-independent approach, where we can talk about the general characteristics that a scalar field must have to, to accord with the observations? And so if you look at this equation, again, you can look at it as a, a driven harmonic oscillator. You, you have a, a driving term, a force term, and you have a friction term. So you're driven by the steepness of the potential, and you're slowed down by Hubble friction. And so perhaps you can get a general characterization based on which of those terms is, is really dominant. And so you can imagine a case where the field is rolling along, but it's gradually being slowed, slowed down um, as the uh, as the potential gets less steep. And so here's a, an illustration of a potential that looks like that. Uh, or you can imagine a, a case where in the early universe the Hubble expansion is large, the friction term is so big, it's such a drag that the field really is not rolling along the potential at all. It's frozen on the potential. 
But then as the universe expands, the Hubble friction decreases, and that you can then uh, leave the field free to roll. And this is a, an illustration of a potential that, that would do that. And so the question is, is this a useful prescription? And so here we're looking in the phase space of W and W prime. We're looking at the, the dynamics, basically, um, of, of how the pressure, uh, the value of the pressure, and how it changes with time. And we're trying to apply this. So again, this is all just in terms of the kinetic and the potential energies. And what you find is that indeed when you, you write down normal looking potentials, that you do get this separation into these two broad classes. That you get what's called the thawing class. So that was the, the model on the previous side where it started off frozen and then gradually as the universe expands, it thaws. It, it is released to roll. So you get the thawing class that looked like a cosmological constant, W minus one, no evolution, and then it gradually moves away from that. Or you can imagine a case where the field is starting off to roll, but then it gradually slows down and comes to a halt, at least asymptotically. And those are these freezing classes. They start off rolling, they have some dynamics, uh, they start away from minus one, but gradually they move in toward the cosmological constant state. And so this is, is work that Robert Caldwell and I did a few years ago. And we found that to be enormously successful in describing very broad uh, varieties of dark energy models. So there are a couple of lessons to take away from this diagram. Is there sort of a, a gap in between these, uh, sort of no man's land. And what that's caused by is, you, you, here I've shown the curve due to no um, second derivative of the field. So no acceleration of the field. So we're not talking about acceleration of the universe, a double dot, we're talking about the motion of the field. And you have to really fine tune the parameters in order to say that the field is exactly coasting along its potential, that it's not speeding up or slowing down. And because of that fine tuning, most of the cases then avoid that fine tuned case and will fall in one of these two classes. So that gives you this gap here, which says, to, ob to observers that if you can go out and make a measurement that's more precise than, than the width of this gap, then you can say which class of theories this falls under. And so it gives a, a goal for the experimenters to, to go out and do. And so the, the, this says that we need to find the time variation that simply knowing W isn't good enough because if W is minus 0.9, you still don't know which class of theories it is. So you, you need this precision on the time variation um, but the problem is, of course, this gap narrows the closer W gets to minus one, the closer you get a, to a cosmological constant. So you need to know W as well as W prime. But again, the experiments will get more and more difficult as it looks more and more like a cosmological constant. And what redshifts are you putting into your graph? So this is a, a, a dynamics. So the, the redshift would run along a curve uh, along here. So, so this is, a, it's a phase space. So again, redshift runs along. So we, I'll, I'll show later the trajectories of a curve. So a thawing field would start here and sort of curve out to here. And where you are along the curve tells you what redshift. What these blue regions say are the endpoints, the, the values today where the field lies. Okay? So even though the thawing field, for example, always stays within the blue region, where it, is, where it lies today will be within the blue, where the freezing lies today will be within in that blue region. Yeah. So one of the problems with this is if you can't see time variation, if you can only see a, an average W or a constant W, then it's uh, much harder to learn about the physics. So this line basically gives the degeneracy direction for this sort of average, this blurred val view of W. And what you can see is you couldn't really distinguish any of the thawing models. So it could look exactly like a cosmological constant, but it could actually be a thawing model way out here because of the degeneracy. So if you do an experiment with about 5% precision, you really have no idea if it's a cosmological constant or if it's some thawing model out here. You might say, well, at least you know it's not a freezing model, but again, your experiments are never perfectly accurate, and so there's actually some width to this, and you actually do get a, a piece of the freezing uh, um, part of this diagram as well. And so with a constant, uh, with an experiment that only sees a, uh, uh, an averaged va value of W, you really don't pick up the physics at all. You need that time variation. So now, now we're going to some specific models, and we ask, well, how do those behave? And so I've plotted a selection of, of models. We don't need to go into the details of them. Pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson, it's basically a pseudo scalar field, a linear potential, a simple slope. 
uh, a phi to the fourth potential, uh, an extra dimensional theory, and a supergravity inspired theory, just to, to show you what some of these curves look like. And again, you can see that if you look at the endpoints where they exist today, they again are in these two clusters. You have a cluster up here and a cluster down there. And these are the, the, the uh, shaded regions, the freezing and the thawing regions that I showed before, that the endpoints lie within there. So you see there's a diversity that even within, for example, these, these supergravity theories, as you change the parameters of the potential, you're keeping the form of the potential the same, but you're changing the parameters, your curves are different. They're, they're in different parts of the phase space. So up here I've shown, for example, P and GB, three of them. So you still need to figure out, well, if it's a P and GB, what are the parameters of the potential? And so this is a, a problem in getting to the, the heart of the physics. But it turns out that you can calibrate the dynamical behavior by a very simple linear uh, transform of W prime. And when you do that, then these, these uh, families of curves come into very narrow regions in this new space. So I've gone from W, W prime to the value today. So now I'm, I'm fixing it to, to a particular epoch and a particular combination of, of stretch parameters which you're probably familiar with under the simple name of WA. Okay. So this is a measure of the time variation, but if you use a very particular measure of the time variation, you get these beautiful calibrated regions. And so these, these black dashed curves, which are, are different gravitational modifications, all lie in this narrow region. These, these red curves, these supergravity inspired ones, all lie within their region. And all of these thawing type models lie within a very narrow space, uh, na very narrow part of the phase space. And so what this says is we can really distinguish the families of the dark energy very well by using these two parameters, W0 and WA. And if you then ask, well, how well do they actually match up with the exact solutions? If I solve the Klein-Gordon equation, I actually solve for the distances, and they solve it down to the 0.1% level of accuracy, which is better than any observations we can make or will be making within the next 10 years. So what this says is, is these W0, WA, this simple two-parameter way of describing dark energy, is really an extremely robust way of getting at things. And so you put them together, you approximate the equation of state in this way. And again, I want to emphasize there's a lot of misunderstanding in the literature. This is not a Taylor expansion. This is not even really an empirical formula. This is coming from the physics of the phase space dynamics. That's the way that you should be thinking about this. And again, it's tested against the exact solutions to high accuracy. So it's not something that someone just said, well, this equation looks good, nice and simple. There really is physics behind it. So there was a paper in 2001 where people wrote it down as a Taylor expansion, okay? And, and it faded from memory. So in the next two years after that, there were four citations to it. And then in 2003, I came up with a physics explanation, and people still mix them up sometimes. They still think that this is a Taylor expansion. Yeah. But Eric, there are many models where you have the equation of say that goes up and goes down. And the, the, that's right. And the data very well. And, and you couldn't fit it with that formula. Y yes, you can. So, so this was in this paper here. We took uh, a model that oscillates. Okay. And again, if you put the physics in, so if you have an oscillating model, these tend to have a high fraction of dark energy at early times, which you can constrain very well. So we went through this, and we showed that you still have that level of accuracy up to the point where you start to um, violate the, the high redshift conditions. I'm not saying there's no model that you could do to fine tune it, but generally the, the oscillations don't show up in the distance relationships because they're double integrals. So the observations are very accurate. It's true you're not recreating the equation of state function uh, as accurately, but it, it does work pretty well. And, and again, we go through some non-monotonic um, uh, uh, cases in, in this article. Yes? So, so for most models, this is good all the way out to recombination. Um, as Axel mentions, in non-monotonic models, um, it starts to break down because you get this early dark energy, and so it's still good out to about redshift three, and then it breaks down. Again, we have a table in this paper where we give it as a function of different redshift cuts, 
how accurate it is. Okay. I was not sure your answer. Are you referring to your W A here is an effective W, a parent W, mm -hmm. or W that really is the equation of state of the we, we are approximating the equation of state by this equation, but then if you ask, well, how good does that approximation do on the observables compared to the exact solution, so you actually solve the supergravity uh, 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 equations of motion, then it's good to the 10 to the minus 3 accuracy. Okay. So let's talk about, so, so this is a, a functional parameterization, a two-parameter way of doing it. Let's talk about some other ways of, of describing the, the dark energy density. So there's constant uh, W, and, and I think I showed this on uh, Monday as well. And again, you get very nice constraints when you uh, have this complementarity between the observations. Um, again, you have to take systematics into account. Currently, systematics sort of double the uncertainties that you have. Um, so systematics are important to, to include. However, as I mentioned, constant W is really very non-generic. It's, it's a very fine-tuned field that'll give you a constant W. You don't expect it from any fundamental theory. You could instead do bins of W. You say, well, what is the value of W within a particular redshift bin, the next redshift bin, and so forth? And that's extremely difficult to do with, with current data. You can see the error bars once you go past redshift one, basically are, it can be anything at all, that, uh, any value at all, you have no constraints. And even past redshift to half, the constraints are, are pretty bad, um, even when you add all three of these together. But you have to be very careful in the literature when you see these binning things to see how sensitive it is to the binning. And so, for example, there was a paper that talked about from uh, what is the dark energy like redshift greater than one, but they did their bin in such a way that they included the, the uh, values less than uh, redshift one. And so this is exactly the same data. I've just done two different binnings in the top and the bottom. And it looks like you have a good constraint all the way out to redshift two. But all of that leverage is coming from that data. You can see if you bin it this way, you have no constraint at all there. So binning is, is OK, but you have to be very careful in, in the interpretation. So currently, we have no idea that w really is minus one. We know that the, the average w, the constant value of w, is consistent with it. And we also have no idea what dark energy was doing at redshifts greater than one. Eric, I, I didn't understand. What function they use to parameterize the, the W? So, so it's, just, it's just top hat functions. So W within uh, a given redshift yes. bin. Yes. So you can also do it through principal components. You can do it through weighted functions, Chebyshev polynomials, whatever you want. Um, but again, the physics, you know, there's only so much information in the data. You'll get the same answer out. Okay. Yes, yes. So the other thing you can do is, again, work within a specific model. Instead of trying to be model independent, you, you choose a specific model and you just say, is this consistent with the data? Ideally, you would have some motivation for that model because there's an infinite number of models as you find in an infinite number of archive papers. So you want to choose a few models. And so what we did is we took the latest data. Um, this is a, led by a grad student at Berkeley, David Rubin. Um, we took the latest data and we compared it to 10 different models. And so you're doing exact solutions within 10 different models. And we tried to choose models that we, we could at least vaguely argue to ourselves were motivated in some way. So here's a, a list of models. I won't go through them in detail. They're, they range between having two and three free parameters. And then we compared their goodness of fit to the simple lambda CDM flat model. And what you find is basically almost all of them are equally good fits as lambda CDM, even taking into account the, the number of parameters. So uh, in particular, some of the, the models here do not approach lambda in any region of their phase space. So, so obviously, if a model has some limit where it looks like lambda, then you can always say that it'll be an equally good fit. But some of these models do not have that limit, they're completely distinct. Uh, and again, the physics is completely distinct in all of the cases. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, I'll show you two examples of, of the fits. Um, so the very first dark energy model was written down by Andre Linde in, in 1986, and this is simply a linear potential, down a linear potential. And this was also highlighted in, in Steven Weinberg's uh, textbook uh, this last year as well. It's, it's just a nice, particle physics model, you can argue for it in various ways, but 
All it is is, is a slope. Um, two parameters, V0 can be translated into omega matter, and V prime can be translated into the value of, of W today, um, or the doomsday time, as, as I call it. So the idea is you're rolling down this linear potential, and there's nothing to stop you from rolling off to minus infinity. And so instead of acceleration, eventually it turns around, and you get deceleration, you get collapse. So the universe re is ex accelerating now, but then recollapses in the future. And so you have doomsday in a finite time. And so the question is, how much time do we have left? So here's, here's the plot of omega matter versus T dooms. Take all our data together, and we find that we have, well, at least about one and a half Hubble times further in the future before doomsday uh, occurs to us. So that's moderately comforting. At least we have about 24 billion years to figure out the dark energy problem and, and find out if there'll be doomsday or not. But what's really interesting is when you go away from the land of CDM space, a lot of the things that, that are just stuck in your mind um, don't work anymore. And so we are used to thinking about how great it is that there's complementarity between the different observational probes. And that's not, that's not a given. So for example, here you see that BAO and CMB are telling you the exactly same things in these models. You do not have complementarity between those probes. And it was very interesting as we go through these 10 different models to look at, well, which observations really are complementary? And the answer is supernovae are always complementary to whatever other probe, superno um, CMB or BAO. And so again, I argued on the first lecture for why supernovae are very important, being a, such a direct probe. And here's another argument that as you go away from the vanilla models that people deal with, supernova really still have a lot of leverage. And again, you can see the, exactly the same thing in the W naught plane, that they really are lined up in the same direction. The other model I'll talk about is an extra dimensional model for, for gravity, where you have a, a bulk, a higher dimensional bulk. Gravity weakens. So you have the, the DGP, the Dvali Gabadadze Porati, uh, form of the, the modified Friedman equation. And here I've plotted in terms of the matter density and the amount of curvature. So this is a highly predictive model. If you set it to flat, there is only one parameter, just the, the matter density or the crossover scale. Okay? So it's an excellent theory in that it is so predictive. And on the unfortunate thing about highly predictive theories is that you can actually rule them out reasonably. So here again, we see the BAO, CMB, and, and supernovae. In this theory, the three are very complementary to each other. And you get this really tiny error bar. And so you might say, oh, OK, I've really determined the dark energy. But again, one of the basic lessons are you can always find a best fit. The question is, is that best fit a good fit? Okay? And what you find is you get a tiny error bar because these three are pretty discrepant with each other. So you get a best fit, but the chi-squared is just not very good. The other thing to take into account is systematic, systematic, systematics. It's just so important. If you ignore systematics, so you just take the, the statistical uh, error bars on the supernovae, for example, then what you find is that the, the delta chi squared is positive 15, and you would immediately rule that model out and say, okay, we can forget about uh, uh, that as an explanation. But when you look at the systematic error bars, when you include what you should include, you find the delta chi squared is just positive 2.7, which you cannot rule out a theory on. And so you've got to include the systematics when you are, are looking at the viability of theories. All right, so uh, uh, the, the basics of this is we cannot assume that with present data, lambda is the answer because you can write down dozens of other theories that fit uh, equally well. And in fact, two of the models actually do better than chi squared, uh, better in chi squared than lambda, even when you take into account their additional parameters. Um, systematics are extremely important. I went through that. You have to be able to see W prime. And then there's some lessons for experimentalists that, again, as you move away from the vanilla models, you've got to rethink what your experiment is seeing. Do you have the complementarity? And in fact, the systematics, the, the way that systematics will influence the results change as you go for, uh, to different fiducial models. Simon? Yeah, I have a question. I don't understand why the BAO and the supernovae give different answers, because the supernovae are effectively measuring the angle of the uh, Imanovsky distance of the part of the redshift. That's right. So, so the difference is where they're anchored. Supernova are anchored to low redshift, whereas BAO are anchored to the sound horizon at high redshift. 
And so there's a different combination of parameters. It's not the distance, but it's the distance. So supernova is the distance relative to the distance at low redshift, which is independent of cosmology. BAO are the distance relative to the sound's horizon size. OK, so I've mostly talked about scalar fields, but I threw in the, the DGP brain world as a gravity theory. And we have to remember that even if it's not a physical scalar field, you can still define it in terms of an effective equation of state and the effective dynamics. So if we write down the Friedman equation as just saying, well, we know there's matter in the universe, and we're not sure what else there is. So we, we say we admit our ignorance, and we just put it into this extra term, some modification to the, the matter expansion. Um, then you can always define an effective equation of state in terms of that ignorance parameter. Okay? So for the expansion history, for the homogeneous universe, you can talk about W as though it were a scalar field, even if it's not physically uh, an actual scalar field. And so if you want to learn more, then you have to go beyond the expansion history. So first, let me, let me just show you the phase diagram for DGP. Um, so DGP acts like a freezing scalar field. It starts off uh, in a tracking solution. It comes in at different redshifts. And today, it's reached down here. These green dotted regions show the freezing region of scalar fields. And so today, it's acting just like a, a freezing scalar field. If you do other powers of modification to the uh, Friedman equations, such as the volley turner approach, then all the curves also look very similar. It's just these sort of parabolic shapes that come in. So you can always explain the expansion history of this brain world scenario with an effective W of A, with an effective scalar field. But that will break down when you get to the growth history, because the gravity is different. The, the, the framework for the growth perturbations are different. And so you really want to have both expansion measures and growth measures to break this degeneracy in, in, how, in the physics explanations for the data. So we've had a number of lectures on, on linear perturbation theory. I'm not going to go through them at all. Uh, so let me just sort of cut to the chase. You have a, a, a simple linear growth equation. You can ask how you can, you can, of course, do the exact solution, right? It's not a difficult equation to do the exact solution. But again, you want, may want a model independent uh, approach. Instead of doing the solution for every single theory, you want a, a phenomenological phase space. So Jim Peebles, all the way back in 1980, before we even knew about dark matter, um, found that there was a very good approximation to the solution to this, that the, the time rate of change of growth could be written as the, the history of the matter density to some power. And so what we're going to do in our phenomenology is we're just going to generalize that to some other power. And then we can look at many, many different theories. So, so again, when Jim did this, we didn't even know about cold dark matter, hot dark matter. Um, certainly didn't know about dark energy. Um, all we're going to do is generalize that to a different power. And what you find is that when you do look at the, the full range of dark energy theories um, that are out there, that you get a, a very good approximation using this phenomenology. And in the limit of non-relativistic matter, which is what Jim knew about, you get back this 0.6 value. So you can actually explain where the 0.6 comes it, from. Dark matter was not in 1980. It was not cold in dark matter, cold dark matter wasn't. Even cold dark matter was beginning. But dark well, Jim was, Jim was doing primordial isocurvature, baryon, so I, you know. Dark matter since the 70s. With Vera Rubin. Yes. Right. So there was dark matter in galaxies. Was there dark matter cosmologically? Okay. In 1980. Okay. Uh, at the time of galaxy formation theory, in 78, it was all about condensation of gas in dark matter halos. Okay. All right. Good. After all, correctly, you only had the 75th anniversary of the discovery of dark matter last year. Uh, right. You can go back to his wiki as well. Okay. Good, good point. Um, so, so, again, this sort of uh, phenomenological parameterization works very well for dark matter. And in fact, we were able to derive it from first principles um, in this uh, paper with, with Bob Kahn. And again, you want to compare it then to the exact solutions and say, OK, it's a, a fitting formula, an approximation. How good is it actually? And again, it's good uh, down to the, about the 0.1% level. Axel? Here, here, the equation of state you mean for dark matter, not for dark energy. No, this is dark energy. Yeah, so, so what we ask is we want to know what is the influence of either modified gravity or dark energy on the growth. So we're, we're going after the, the growth suppression here. Okay. 
So the, the one caveat that we did in the derivation here is we had to start from a high redshift matter-dominated ep epoch, which is not much of a caveat because we certainly think there was matter domination. But I'll get back to that in a couple of slides. So again, what goes into growth is not purely the expansion history. Well, the first thing to realize is that it's, it's almost purely the expansion history. So I've written here the, the perturbation theory, dividing out the matter case where delta just goes as A, as, as Carlos showed. Um, and I've written it in terms of the expansion parameters, in terms of, of the Hubble parameter squared. And again, this is also the, an expansion history uh, parameter here. So if you write it like that, it's very clear that the expansion history determines the growth history. So the one caveat is over on the right-hand side, where that zero goes to some generic function as you change the theory of gravity. So in general relativity, that's a zero, and then expansion determines growth. But in general, there'll be some function. In fact, there'll be some scale-dependent function. I haven't written the scale dependence in here, but, but that's a, a further complication. And so if you look for a solution, again, we, we had this omega m to the gamma on the previous page. You find that it's not only good for the, the instantaneous growth today, but it can be good for the entire growth history. And again, it's accurate to that 10 to the minus 3 level in history. So this gives you a model-independent phenomenological way uh, to, to get to this. And again, I should mention also that uh, Wang and Steinhardt first started to, to take this uh, from dark matter over to dark energy. Uh, so it turns out that this one single new parameter, this gamma, what I'll call the growth index, um, is an is excellent approximation. You might think you need a whole function, but this one constant parameter actually is a very good way of saying how does what expansion tells you growth should do differ from what growth actually does when you fold in uh, modifications to gravity as well. So again, good to this, this 10 to the minus 3 level. And so while we would like to, to do in fitting observations is to fit this whole set of parameters to describe uh, the cosmology, the matter density or the dark energy density, the equations of state and its time variation, and now to test general relativity, this gamma parameter to, to talk about how growth goes. And in philosophy, this is somewhat similar to what you do in dark matter. Again, in dark matter, as, as we'll hear from Anne Green's lecture on Friday, there are, there are many very complicated models but people want to do a unified framework where they can sort of see the constraints of experiments uh, all, all together. Um, and so you do a very simple framework. So there you would talk about something like M Sugra, where people realize that's not the real theory, but it's a nice phenomenological compact way of talking about it. And so you should think of this in the same way, that it's a phenomenological approximation, but it's a very accurate approximation. So, if we want to test general relativity, then we need to have that, that uh, data on both the growth and the expansion. And we look for a tension between what the distances say for growth. Uh, and so, for example, you should see Michael Mortensen's uh, poster out there where he goes through this in some detail. What the distances say should happen for growth and what actually happens for growth, because that is a, a signpost to deviations from general relativity. So the expansion history you want to keep in terms of the very successful parameterization of W of Z. The growth deviation, you can use this gamma parameter. And you want to do, all, you want to do a global fit. If you fail to do that, if you assume general relativity and it really isn't, then you bias your results. And so this shows what a, a deviation of, of 0.1 in the value of gamma does. That you, in, you would, instead of it thinking that it's the, instead of it being, if it's really the cosmological constant, but it's also a modification in gravity, you would instead think that it's a scalar field very different than the cosmological constant. And so you would not identify the correct physics. So I gave the little caveat before that in the formal derivation, we had to assume matter domination at high redshift. And I've been thinking about that in, in the last year or so, wondering if there's a way of getting around that, because people do have theories where you do violate matter domination. There's early dark energy theories, for example. Some modified gravity theories um, have uh, deviations at high redshift. And so this is very recent work. It, it was just posted to the archive last week. Um, and it's a very simple change. So before we had this, and all I've done is I put a, an extra uh, constant factor out front, basically a calibration parameter. And so up until now, this has just been one. So it's one if you're just purely matter dominated uh, uh, at early times. 
And again, it, you want to test that when you add, when you expand your, your fitting space, that you don't mess up the, the previous space that you had. You can still get constraints there. Um, and as well, you want to make sure that the physics is distinct, that you're not sort of blending the physics from, from uh, the expansion in with this calibration. And again, you test, and again, you find this very nice accuracy to, to the 10 to the minus 3 level. So now I'm advocating that we fit five parameters. And in this article, I show that with next generation data, you can get good constraints on all five of these parameters. And so people who are very uncomfortable with saying, you know, we had this discussion on, on Monday, why should you be able to fit dark energy with just one or two parameters? What I'm saying now is, is yeah, I think we, we are able to fit it with more parameters. We can only do two equation of state parameters describing the homogeneous universe, but we can add two parameters to explain the inhomogeneous universe. And the level that you can test this matter domination at is such that if there were early dark energy as the explanation for violating matter domination, you can test it down to the 0.5% the, uh, level. If there was some modification uh, in gravity of varying Newton's constant, you can test it down to the 1.5% the level. Or if uh, you have an early period of acceleration. So one of the ways of solving the coincidence problem is to have repeated epochs of acceleration. So there's no coincidence, we just happen to live in one of many epochs of acceleration. If that happens, you could constrain the length of that period of early acceleration, again, to the 1.5% level. So I think this is a, an interesting formalism. I want to mention that in the literature, there are a number of different approaches at getting at gravity, which all have their particular interesting points. And so in particular, um, Wayne and his students um, have a very uh, robust and rigorous formal way of, of going after it, um, where you actually solve for the metric potentials um, that the modified gravity theory uh, goes in. And those have been extremely successful at describing these uh, modified gravity theories, F of R theories, and, and other theories. And so that's uh, an alternative uh, approach, which again has this, this very uh, strong, uh, rigorous basis to it. You can also parameterize instead of the growth, um, you can parameterize again the metric potentials in a sort of parameterized post-Newtonian formalism. And there's quite a few people who have taken that approach. And that's also an interesting approach. Personally, and, and again, I'm not saying that my approach is better than others, it's just I like it personally because you're parameterizing more directly the observations. You observe more or less the growth factor and the derivatives of the growth factor, and so I like parameterizing closer to the observations. But again, these are nice in having a very strong formal basis to them. You can do these tests of gravity in terms of, in general relativity, these should, should simply be uh, equal and, and I think in my notation, equal and opposite. Uh, to each other um, by doing different types of observations, in particular doing imaging surveys versus spectroscopic surveys. So here's a nice diagram by, by Bhuvnes Jain and Peng Ji Jung um, where he shows the different types of observations you can make, either probe the dynamics, the, the motion uh, within space, giving you one of the potentials, or uh, other things like the probing the deflection angle in gravitational lensing, which probes another combination of these parameters. So you can hope to fit all of these. So let me just uh, sort of finish up with what I'll call surprises. Again, we should expect there to be surprises in the dark sector. It, it should be presumably at least as complicated as, as the sector, the standard model sector. So the things that we normally say about dark energy, that it's, that it's dark, it's non-interacting, that it's smooth and that it's accelerating, um, things may not be quite so simple. We should certainly start from that foundation, but we do have to keep in, keep in mind that perhaps it's not completely dark, maybe it does cluster, and maybe acceleration is not uh, uh, the final fate of the universe, just as in Linde's original model. So there's still a lot of theoretical research needed, and let me remind you of the definition of research as given by a, a very famous uh, applied physicist, So, you know, we don't know what we're doing in dark energy. We're trying a lot of things, and we always want to try to keep it within reality. Um, but we really don't know very much about dark energy at all. There could be coupling between, we've, we've heard a number of the contributor talks talking about uh, coupling, and again, it could not be energy at all. It could be a, a modification of the gravitational physics. If you look at the historical track record when we've been faced with a puzzle, so in the 19th century, we were faced with the, the the puzzle of the motion of Mercury, the orbit of Mercury, did not agree with, with Newtonian gravity. Again, you have the alternative, do I add a new component, 
like a scalar fields for dark energy, or do I change the laws, uh, as in, in, in modified gravity? And the answer there was you change the laws. People talked about adding a new component, a new planet inside the orbit of Mercury, and that was not the answer. If you look at the puzzle in the 18th century of the outer solar system motions, the, the, the orbit of, of Uranus, then again, you could say, do I change the laws of gravity or do I add a new component? And there the answer was, I add a new component. I add a new planet, Neptune, which of course was discovered. It's always important to then actually discover the thing that you're, you're proposing. We have the, the, the current puzzle of galaxy rotation curves and we're pretty sure the answer there is to add a new component, to add dark matter. But there's a number of people who think that instead of adding a new component, you want to add a, a, you want to change the, the theoretical framework. Um, so you always want to make sure that your experiments can give you an unambiguous uh, insight, an unambiguous answer. So you have to ask what can go wrong in our interpretation. So again, we've already talked of, about the fact that there can be um, two potentials entering into the metric. There can be an anisotropic stress, either from the difference of these or if it's a, a fluid, then there's anisotropic stresses there. The gravitational constant could change in time. There can be microphysics in the dark energy so that it clusters a sound speed not equal to the speed of light, and there can be coupling between components. So it could be a very complicated framework. Um, well, let's look at the observations. Supernova distances, as I talked about in the first lecture, come directly from the metric. Supernova distances don't care about any of these things at all. They're probing the expansion history. So that's a very clean probe. Lensing is pretty clean. It does depend on the deflection angle. And these sort of clumping and, and time varying parameters, not so much. Barren acoustic oscillations do depend that you're dealing with a standard cold dark matter scenario. So they do care if you have an isotropic stress, if you have clumping of the dark energy, interaction of the dark energy, and so forth. So here's an argument that supernova are simple. And now simple is good and simple is also bad. So this is what could go wrong. But if we ask, if we ask what could go right, I would write down the same list. You know, which probe could go deeply into understanding dark energy? And I'd say, look at the AO. It's sensitive to all these things. Isn't that a great probe for getting at uh, the, the depths of, of the dark energy? So you want to have both the simplest probes and the richest or most complicated probes, depending on, on your philosophy. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll go to a, a famous physicist for a good quote about this. It could well be that the sensation of yesterday, the discovery of dark energy, of the accelerated expansion by supernovae um, will eventually become a calibration that will use the supernova observations of the expansion history to look for deviations from gravity from these other probes. And then tomorrow it may be an annoying background the way many people think that the CMB is an annoying background to, to, uh, to learning about um, cluster physics and, and other things that are going on. So here's the end of the lecture. Again, the uh, last time I talked about the, the observations, here I've talked about the theories, and then I'll talk about actually getting down to nuts and bolts and actually comparing the observations to the theories, bringing them together. And again, here's a, a list of some uh, review articles recently, and there's a lot of references within those that you can take a look at. Thank you.